to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17, verse number 30. We welcome you to our study of Acts chapter 17 through 19, and we hope you'll stay tuned as we study about the gospel going to Thessalonica, Corinth, and Ephesus. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855-855. 458 3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is now going to be taking the gospel in his missionary journeys to the region of Thessalonica. And the gospel is here met with persecution because as Paul begins to preach the gospel, as people begin to obey that and as lives begin to change, there is a natural reverberation to that among society and its immoral way. I want you to notice Acts 17, verses 5 and 6, that Christians in the first century, just like Christians today do, did receive persecution at times. Notice Acts 17, the Bible records this in verse 5, but the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, Those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Friend, one thing that you consistently see in the preaching of the gospel and its change to lives and society is it's always met with persecution by evil people. Jason and his house and those who they thought were there are going to be persecuted. They drag them out. They're going to do great harm or try to to them. And friend, as we try to live the Christian life, let's realize that from time to time, in our opposition to evil, immoral governments and ungodliness, persecution will come. Friends, this ought not to come as a surprise to us because the Bible promised that persecution would come. Do you remember the words of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12? The Bible says all, not some, not a few, not a little bit, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 
persecution is going to come. It is sometimes a, a response to people who do not love Christ, want to continue in immorality, and need to do God's will, and thus it's a, a response to an opposition to the preaching of the gospel. Paul said in Acts 14, verse 22, after he'd been dragged out of the city, left for dead, had, been left, had thought they'd stoned him, he rose up and said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. But friend, when we face persecution, let's also realize that we don't have to face it alone. God has promised us, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let's realize that we're fighting, we're, we're working for the best cause in the world, the salvation of souls. And friend, as you think about this context in Thessalonica where these men are going to be persecuted, I want you to listen to what the opposition says about the preaching of the gospel. Listen again to Acts 17, 6. They brought these people out and they said to the mob, these are the men who have turned the world upside down down for Jesus or for Christianity. You know, really, they had that statement backward. The G Christians were not trying to turn the world upside down. They were trying to put the world right side up. They were trying to get things back in the proper order of the way God wanted it. They were trying to set God's morals, God's teaching, and the gospel in its proper place. But to these people, it looked like it was upside down. Things are drastically changing. People who used to be involved in this, people who used to be a part of this, no longer want to do that. Why? Because the gospel has now changed their life. And friend, the gospel ought to make a great change. It ought to look like there's been an upheaval in people's life, a drastic change. Listen to Matthew 5, verse 16. Jesus said, Let your light, the gospel light, so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Friend, as we try to live for Christ, there ought to be an amazing change that is visible to people and it ought to make drastic changes in our lives and the lives of others. Christianity really ought to turn the world right side up. And that's the mo motivation in the preaching of the gospel to change people's lives. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, to the young evangelist Timothy, be an example to the believers in word and conduct and love and spirit and in faith and purity. Our life ought to serve as an example to those who are trying to live and do right. And no wonder it brought persecution. Anytime there's a, a drastic change, people don't adapt to that too well sometimes. And when that change, especially as you'll see in Acts 19, hits people in their pocketbook, people began to make opposition to that in a very rapid way. In Acts chapter 17, we also learn a, a powerful lesson about the Bereans who are now going to hear the gospel and their noble heart. This is one of the magnificent blockbuster passages in the New Testament. Notice Acts 17, what is said in verse number 11. The Bible records these were more fair-minded, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why? In that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Now, you imagine the scenario. Paul comes to the region of Berea. He knocks on the door. They open the door and they realize it's Paul who used to be Saul who is doing harm to the church. And they say, Paul, we've heard about you. And Paul says, wait a minute now, I've changed. I want to tell you about Christ. I want to tell you about the gospel. What did they do the moment they opened that door and saw it was Saul or now Paul standing there? Did they slam the door in his face? They say, no, we don't want to hear about it. No, they said, Paul, come on in, sit down, in essence. Paul sat down, they sat down, Paul began to preach the gospel, no doubt from the Old Testament, showing Jesus is the Messiah. And what did they do next when Paul began to preach about Jesus? Did they, did they immediately accept it? Did they right then just say, well, you, you said it, so it must be true? No. They said, Paul, we've heard what you had to say. Uh, we've taken notes of that. Now we're going to check you. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things, what things? The things Paul was saying, the things Paul was claiming, the things Paul was pointing out from the Scriptures. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things he was saying were according to the Word of God. Friend, listen carefully. 
One of the things that every person who is seeking truth must do is let this book be our final guide. Friend, there's a whole lot of problems that are occurring today, and one of the biggest ones is people believe what they're told hook, line, and sinker. They think just because somebody who claims to be speaking the Word of God says it means it must be true. Well, friend, listen carefully. There are a host of false teachers whose motives are not what they ought to be, who are teaching things that are not according to this book. And if I'm going to have a good and noble heart, I've got to search the Scriptures. And friend, that's what God wants me to do. Listen carefully. This is not opposed to God's will. This is in harmony with the will of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 Paul encouraged the young evangelist Timothy, Study. To show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Peter said, be ready always to give an answer. First Peter 3, verse 15, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 26. And so here's the practical application. Friend, just because somebody stands up maybe behind a pulpit or uh, presents themselves as a spokesman of God and says, you know, this is what God wants you to do. Friend, you're not obligated at that point alone to believe it. Here's what we are obligated to do. We're obligated to search the Scriptures. If it's true because God said it, then our obligation is to God. We obey God, not men. Acts chapter 5, verse 26 through 29. And so, and don't just believe what people tell you. A whole host of people are going to be in or headed down the wrong direction today because somebody who had a suave look and a smooth voice said... This is from God, and this is what God says you need to do. When in reality, that person and every person who speaks on behalf of God needs to be checked by the Bible. Isn't that why God gave us the Bible? Jesus said, you can know the truth, and the truth will make you free. John chapter 8, verse 32, I can search and seek and prove all things. First Thessalonians 5, verse 21, and then when I've done that, I obey it because God said it. And that's the backbone and the security of what we know to be truth. And so we want to be like the Brians. We want to search the Scriptures and make sure these things are true to the will of God. Now, friend, let's realize another point that we learn from Acts chapter 17, and that is Paul is in a very, an area that is uh, very religious, we might say. Idolatry and false religion is popular in that day. And there are people who are religious in a sense. But friend, just because somebody's religious, don't equate that with that person being right with God. Let me illustrate. I want you to look in Acts chapter 17, and I want you to notice what Paul says to the idolaters on Mars Hill. Notice these words. Paul says in verse 22 of Acts chapter 17, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. There was no doubt these people were religious minded. But friend, just because somebody is religious minded doesn't mean, automatically mean they're right with God. They had a host of uh, uh, idols, even an idol to the unknown God. And Paul takes that point and preaches Christ to them. But friend, there are a lot of people who want to be religious. There are a lot of people, no doubt, who are even sincere. But Paul said in Romans 10 verses 1 and 2, you have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. You know, we can think of people who, even in our own lives, we may think are religious people. But friend, listen very carefully. Let's not be persuaded by those who seem to be religious, those who even have that desire, but let's let the Word of God be our guide in all things. It's one thing to be religious. It's another thing to be religious and follow the teaching of the Scriptures according to the Word of God. And so here's a, a couple of practical lessons. Friend, let's not let face just a, on the surface appearance 
be that which persuades us. And secondly, you remember the Jews. Jesus said, you know, of the Jews, uh, you appear to men to be uh, these great uh, people of religious nature. And Jesus said, in reality, you're nothing but whitewashed tombs. Beautiful, ornate on the outside, on the inside, full of dead men's bones. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 23. And then secondly, let's not let emotion, and even an emotion toward religion, be that which guides us. There are a lot of people who may be, may be emotional about religion, but emotion alone and desire alone does not make one right with Almighty God. Those things have to be aligned with truth. Again, the truth is what makes us free. John 8, verse 32. The truth is God's Word. John 17, 17. And we must obey and live by the truth and worship by the truth each and every day. John chapter 4, verse number 24. Now, as part of Paul's message to these idolaters in Athens, he begins to preach Christ to them. And these people, again, are, are caught up in idolatry. And here's what Paul will say. Paul will say, I want to tell you about the unknown God, the one whom you worship without knowing. And he goes on from creation. He goes on from the proofs around them. And he begins to preach Christ. And he preaches the message of, of how God created through one man all, all nations to serve him. And that was his ultimate desire. And he brings that to a climax. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, notice what the Apostle Paul says here by inspiration. The Scripture records, Truly, these times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because He has appointed a day on which He would judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained, and He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. What's Paul's main emphasis here? There's a day coming when God's going to judge the world. He proved that by the resurrection of His Son from the dead, which nobody in that age could deny. And because of that, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Friend, we're living on that side of the cross and the resurrection. There is no excuse today. Men are without excuse today. God has given ample evidence. You can look around and know there's a God. We can look at the changing of the seasons, Acts 14, Romans 1, verses 19 through 21, and we can see by the evidence there's a God. What does that evidence and the evidence of the resurrection, what does that demand? God still commands all men everywhere to repent and turn to Him. Jesus said, unless you repent you'll all likewise perish. Now we turn our attention to Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, Paul is going to be going to the region of Corinth. Much of the information we need to learn about the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians is found in Acts chapter 18. And here are some of those things we learn. Paul in Acts 18, 8, to Crispus and others of the synagogue, preaches the gospel. And he says in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. You know, you kind of have the gospel in a nutshell. They heard the word. They believed in Jesus and they were baptized. That's God's plan of salvation in a nutshell. And friend, as you think about Paul and his preaching the gospel there, uh, one of the things that you're, you can be sure of is Paul was never ashamed of the gospel. And we must never be ashamed of the gospel today. That gospel is still what saves men and women's souls. And we never need to be ashamed even of correcting someone who may be in error. You look in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 26, and you've got a man by the name of Apollos. Apollos is a good man, a very eloquent man. But all he knows is the former baptism of John. He doesn't know anything about the baptism of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so Priscilla and Aquila, they pull him aside and they teach him the gospel. Look in Acts chapter 18. And I want you to notice what the Word of God records in verse number 26. The Bible says, So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. That's Apollos. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now, how did uh, Apollos respond? He didn't get mad. He didn't get upset. 
He listened. And when he saw it was truth, he's ready to obey that because now he knows more fully, more accurately the way of God. A couple of very important principles that we mentioned to learn here. Number one, we always need to stand up for, teach the truth, and even in the right attitude, try to correct those who are in error. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4, verse number 15. And then secondly, we need to realize that a lot of people need to, we need to have, and a lot of people in this world need to have the heart and the attitude of Apollos. They pull him aside. Stop what he's doing. He's preaching the gospel, preaching what he thinks is truth. They realize that's not complete, isn't everything he needs to know. They pull him aside. They teach him. They show him more accurately. He learns that. And Apollos goes on to be a great worker for the Lord. It's possible for each of us to grow, to develop, to be corrected and to learn more and more each and every day of our life. And so great example here from Apollos and from Priscilla and Aquila. Then the gospel goes in Acts chapter 19 to the idolatrous region of Ephesus where there was the temple Diana where there was Demetrius, a goldsmith, a, a, a man who worked with Medlin, who made many statues and had a great living made off of that. And now the gospel is going to go there. And again, there's going to be resistance to that. But first of all, I want you to notice what is said in Acts chapter 19, verses 3 through 5, about John's baptism. The Bible says, and he said to them, into, this is uh, Apollos, and he's here speaking to the area. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Or Paul speaking. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on the Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here you've got people coming out of one system into another. You've got, of course, the Old Testament system. You've got John preaching a preparatory baptism. And then when Christ comes, now we have what Acts 2.38 shows. Baptism into Christ for the remission of sins. And so Paul's in this area. Some aren't teaching the full gospel. And Paul shows them more perfectly the way of the Lord as well. And they're baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what is the import of this idea? Friend, it's all about learning the truth about God's plan of salvation in the New Testament. And they were authorized and commanded to do exactly what God wanted them to do. No doubt, John's baptism was preparatory. Matthew 3, verses 2 and 3, his way was to prepare people for the Lord. There was even a sense in which it was for the forgiveness of sins predicated on the blood of Jesus. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. But friend, let's also realize this was not the final and permanent baptism. Luke 3, verse 16, one comes after me. John would say it's his baptism that would be significant. And friend, that is baptism into the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I want you to notice another principle that we learn from Acts chapter 19. And this is really important about Christianity being the way today. Look in Acts chapter 19 and notice what the scripture records in verse number 9. The Bible says, But when some who were hardened and did not believe spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he goes on to depart from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now we think about Christianity. These words are probably used in a negative sense about some of the people of that day. But friend, what a great application there is, no doubt. Christianity is the way. Think about this. It is the way to God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, one and only, unique. In all, it's the only way to get to God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. It is the way of salvation. 1 John 2, verse 25, this is the promise. He's promised us eternal life. It, Christianity is the best way to live. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. And friend, it's the way to real happiness. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the seat of sinners, sits in the seat of scornful, but blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. What way of life can bring us ultimate happiness? 
salvation, a home with God, and joy in this life. Christianity is the way of life. They can do exactly that. And friend, as we think today about God's plan of salvation, as we think today about the power of the gospel, look at what happened in Thessalonica. Turn the world upside down. Look what happened in Acts chapter 18 as the gospel goes to Corinth and, and leaders of the synagogue, rulers there, sorcerers obey the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 19, they sell their magic books. They obey the gospel. A, a, a great number of people, Acts 19 verse 20, in that city obey the Lord. Look at the changes that occurred then. And friend, the gospel still has that power today. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Friend, we ask you today, has the gospel had the opportunity to change your life? Has it had the opportunity to turn your life right side up? People viewed it as upside down, but in reality, the gospel turns life the right way, the way God wants it to be. Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If not, we're begging you to do that today. Would you hear the word of God? Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Having heard that message, would you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Having believed, would you be willing to change your life and repent? Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men? With the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, verse 10. And would you, to have your sins washed away, to get into Christ the way, would you be immersed in water on that great day of Pentecost? In Acts 2, verse 38, the apostle Peter stood up with the eleven and proclaimed, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly God's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord of Christ. And he said to obey the gospel, they needed to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the remission of their sins. Have you done that? If not, friend, we're encouraging you today. Let the gospel and its power work in your life so that you can have the hope of salvation. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.